Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I've been saying all summer that we're learning what it means to be the church as we read through these stories from the gospel according to Luke. Today we are presented with a passage that both shows us what Sabbath devotion looks like and how being Jesus' hands and feet in the world sometimes looks different from what some people think of as the role of church. So let me start with that second part, about how sometimes what we do as church runs contrary to what other people think our job should be. In the gospel story, the leader of the synagogue, well, he becomes indignant, it says, because he considered what Jesus was doing, this healing, as if it were some kind of work. And if it were work, then Jesus is breaking the Sabbath, breaking the customs of the day. Sabbath is the holy day, a day set aside for devotion to God. People are to gather in the synagogue, meditate on the scriptures, pray with the community. It's not a day for personal work, betterment of your home, betterment of your business. Remember our Ten Commandments, as recorded in Exodus chapter 20? The third commandment is this, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or your female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but God rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it. The point being here, if six days of work are good enough for God, aren't they good enough for us as well? The Sabbath is devoted to God. So when Jesus touches this woman and she is healed, is this work? That's the question that we're asking here. Does a miraculous healing go against the Ten Commandments? Well, Jesus doesn't think so. Right? He might say it's unlawful to work on the Sabbath, but it is necessary, he says, to free those in bondage whenever we have the choice. It is when we do these acts of liberation, setting people free, that Satan's realm is defeated. But sometimes we think, well, no, I've got these other things I'm supposed to be doing. I'm devoted to this certain kind of tradition or this certain kind of custom or a practice that we're used to doing here, and well, I've got to do that. But here's the thing. Sometimes when we stick to those traditions, customs, practices, we might be unwittingly making room for Satan's work. If we keep God before us at all times, then it's the work of God. Even if it is with humans, that's important. You see, being released from what binds us is what allows us to have Sabbath. If you are enslaved, if you are bound to something, to sin, to disease, to some evil master, when you are bound like that, you are unable to rest. You must be continually serving that master. But when you are set free, when you are liberated, when you are restored, then the true purpose of Sabbath is possible. This woman, after she had been freed from her bondage, she can finally contemplate God's steadfast love. She can fully appreciate Sabbath. In fact, what does she do the minute that she's cured? She stands up and praises God. God. Isn't that what the heart of Sabbath should be about? Praising God, not ourselves. Our problem, of course, is we get caught up in the way we've always done it. Or we have these rules for a reason. And when we get to those places, oftentimes we miss how God is at work in the world. Being devoted to the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law well, it can make us disregard those that are actually in need of God's love. Here's what my preaching professor, 
professor from seminary, Dr. Hannon, wrote about today's gospel. She said these things about Jesus. Jesus willingly postpones what he is doing to turn to those in need. Remember, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue when he saw this woman who needed help. He turns from what he's doing to help her. Jesus straightens the bent, so to speak. Something was not right, he set it right. Jesus touches the untouchable. Jesus stands up to his naysayers and his challengers. Jesus prioritizes people over established systems. And above all, Jesus sets people free from bondage. As we learn what it means to be the church, the very presence of Jesus in this time and place, then that list must be our list as well. As the church, we must willingly postpone what we are doing when the option to help somebody comes up. As people of God, we are called to straighten out a bent world. We are called to be with those that others deem untouchable. And as the church, when we are challenged by naysayers over what we are doing, we must stand up to that challenge in the name of Jesus. The church must never overlook the people that it serves and instead focus on institutional, political gain, something like that. Above all, our job as little Christs to each other and this world is to liberate people from their bondage, from sin and death, from the devil. It's challenging work, but it's also exciting work. It's our work. It's what we are here to do today in worship and the rest of the days of our week. Now, I began by saying that this story tells us not only about what Jesus is like and how we model that, but, or how we follow his model, but also that there's this example of Sabbath devotion. So let me talk a little bit more about this. Notice in the story, the woman was crippled by Satan for 18 years. It says she was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. Imagine that, what that must have been like for her. You know, I had an abscess tooth for about two weeks before my root canal last week. And there were days where I could barely do anything. But that was like two weeks. Here she is, 18 years into this ailment. And she's still going to synagogue. She knows a thing or two about devotion. This woman knows a thing or two about setting aside her life's problems in order to understand Sabbath in order to praise God. She was there in the Sabbath on the day that Jesus was there. John Calvin writes this, What other reason is there for holy gatherings than that the faithful might call on God for his help and support? When we gather together week after week, we are a bruised and broken people. And yet we faithfully call on God for help in this room, in our community, the sick are here. Those with diseases are here. In this place, people are recovering from addiction. People are still addicted in this place. Men and women have been mistreated, neglected, abused. In our little flock, there are plenty who wander off needing a shepherd. I tell you what, this place is full of people who are bent over and cannot stand up straight on their own. And yet, like this woman, we still come. Sabbath after Sabbath, we still are devoted to God. We come because we hope that God will heal us. We hope that we will be set free from our chains. We come because it's here that we are accepted just as we are. We come because we know others are hurting as well. Maybe they're broken in the same ways that we are. Maybe it's a different pain that we don't understand. Whatever the case may be, you and I come because we know that it is God who supports us. The God who is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, as we sang in the song. 
I know I told you this whole list of all these things that we're supposed to do, right, as God's people, as the church, but also we come to church so that those things on the list may happen in our lives too. We come here to be noticed, to be accepted, for Jesus to touch us and for us to be healed and liberated. We come because we believe that God's love is beyond measure. We come because like that crowd who witnessed Jesus' miracle, we rejoice in all the wonderful things that God is doing in our world and in our lives. May we ever be a people that keeps God as the focus of our devotion. And may we ever be a church that serves God's people without restraint. Amen.